All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Chris Barassa. Did I pronounce that right? It is. Yeah, we're good. Yes. Chris Barassa from Red Hook Studios. Welcome. And congratulations again on Darkest Dungeon 2's release. Oh, thanks. Uh, 1.0. Congratulations. Thanks. It was, uh, it was a lot of work for the whole team, but everybody uh, pulled together. I'm pretty happy with the results. So thank you. How are things going? It's been about two weeks since the launch. I uh, it it did really well out of the gate. I mean, we'll have to see long term. We've got a lot of plans to support the game, um, Steam Workshop, and free updates, and DLC, and that kind of thing. So, um, we're certainly like enthusiastic. Uh, but everybody's on break. We gave everybody a week off. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, That's good. It was it's always push. important to yeah. take time. And so. Um, I'm not going to really go into like the gameplay and balancing and questions that I'm sure you've already got a hundred questions about. I'm more curious, and I think the channel is as well, about the story and storytelling in this in this uh, game compared to Darkest Dungeon 1. So if you're ready, we'll just start with some of the questions. Let's do it. All right. So beginning with the first question, which is uh, the changes from Darkest Dungeon 1 to Darkest Dungeon 2. And in Darkest Dungeon 1, we kind of stayed in one isolated location. We were in the estate or the hamlet. Um, now we're traveling the whole world, it seems like, or at least this kingdom. What kind of led to that change where you said we want to move away from the estate? I mean, a couple of things. Um... First and foremost, I think, um, which isn't necessarily story related, so I apologize, but um, was our, our, our desire to sort of create something different. We felt like we'd, you know, really uh, done our very best with Darkest Dungeon and, and we're super proud of it. Like, I'm super proud of that game. Um, and it was born of a lot of, like, genuine love and, and passion. And, and you, I think you need that as a as a creator um, because it's very hard to, to make games. And so when things get really hard, you got to believe in, in what you're making. I think that's how you kind of get through some of those challenges. So we wanted to find that feeling again. And we had felt that after four, um, I say we, I'm, t I'm primarily talking about in this context about um, Tyler Sigmund, my uh, business partner, co-founder, design director of the company and I. Um, and we just kind of had felt like after four DLCs, we had packed the hamlet or the estate with a lot of content. You know, um, we added the courtyard, we added the the uh, the Miller's kind of area, um, Butcher's Circus. Uh, you know, it, mm -hmm. it was a really dense spot, and we could kind of hear the the creaking of the timbers. I feel like, um, you know, not just from a, from a mechanical standpoint, uh, but also like narratively. We get it. The ancestor was the biggest piece of trash ever made, and sort of reiterating that in new and exciting ways. I think we're we're going to hit a wall eventually. Um, I'm really, really proud of Crimson Court uh, from a narrative standpoint, and I think that uh, the the narrative wrapper that was put around what amounts to a high score mode with uh, the Farmstead um, Color Madness update was also solid. Um, but we just didn't feel like there was much left to say about this one tract of land or this ancestor character. I felt like there was, we had kind of really well and truly covered the gamut of horrible sin and awfulness that he, that he got up to. And um, it, we felt like we needed a bit more creative room to move um, figuratively and literally. So we really got attached to this idea of, uh, of a road trip, you know, being fundamentally different from uh, kind of a, what amounts to a war, where you make a beachhead and then build up your 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 forces and your base and go out on sorties to try to like reclaim you know real estate. Uh, this was much more mm -hmm. of like a yeah kind of a road trip simulator. I've been on a couple of road trips. They always have surprising and interesting moments, and we kind of got really attached to the idea of small canonical roster, four at a time, sort of a suicide mission type thing. Um, and and just that idea being something that we hadn't explored through the lens of darkest dungeon before became you know um you know obviously the basis for the second game but we felt like it was genuinely fresh and interesting and different and kind of re-excited us to uh to dive back in i guess yeah i mean you bring up that point that you've kind of told the story of the estate and the hamlet and the ancestor that story is kind of 
been done. Yeah, and it's I time think... now to kind of look a little bit deeper, look a little bit beyond, and I think the opportunity to create new places. And like you said, the timber was kind of shaking. How much can we fit into this estate? Yeah. Now we have a whole kingdom to work with. It could be your your mind can run free with who knows what's happening. Yeah, exactly. And I think it goes, the differences go right down into the fundamental conception of horror in, in the second game where, you know, we really leaned in on, on body horror. I don't know how spoilery you want me to be. Um, well, uh, we'll, we'll get to the spoilers near the end. Let's, sure. let's keep it but to Darkest Dungeon just, one, just was, one to two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number one was like, we really leaned in on, on kind of body horror, you know, the climax builds towards that. And I, and I like that stuff, um, in, in the context of sort of the more cosmic kind of framework. Um, but the second one I wanted to explore almost like absolute nothingness as the most horrid appalling concept like an undoing you know um and and i think changing gameplay structure changing the location changing the the narr the narrator's character um just mm -hmm. allowed like equipped us to be able to kind of embark on a on a slightly different tone and a and a and a different but like analogous storyline i guess yeah definitely um and so speaking of that uh we did kind of get a shift, I would say, in our characters this time. You know, we went from the ancestor to the academic, and now we sort of have, like, it went from the heir to, I want to say, the protege or something, like the student, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Is there a is there a canonical name for this this person that we, we are playing as? Uh, we just, we, I called him the protege in the intro cutscene, and it seems to have stuck, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, as part of that, I, I have to ask, is the protege and the air are they the same person from from darkest dungeon one to darkest dungeon two no. is that the same person no no, okay. no they can't be i think that the the tight kind of narrative loop of the first game uh, doesn't really lend itself to a lot of uh marvel cinematic universe style crossovers um and mm -hmm. so yeah, i wanted to touch on it uh briefly in the second game story but um i, th I kind of view them as two events happening kind of contemporaneously in different places. Okay, so it's kind of like Darkest Dungeon 1 is happening, and then this is kind of like a side story. I don't want to say a side story, but its own story that kind of parallels with yeah. the estate. And we do a lot of stuff with reality and time and space, and so yeah. I, I, yeah. I like that just because it affords us kind of a, a bit of mystery, and you know, you can kind of mythologize in your own way. Um, but, you know, that we do have like a an ancestor appearance in in the second game briefly um i think it fits in his timeline appropriately uh you know so i think they're compatible but but really the goal creatively was to make um it kind of approach it as a second entry in an anthology where a lot of the values uh, are similar a lot of the themes are similar but we're just exploring them through a different lens and i think like story-wise it was important to not feel like okay so you know they resolve the first game and then what happens like that's a really tough way to tell a story for me because i feels like the cart's leading the horse like and then they leave the hamlet and then they go here and then and then and then and you're not actually building in like kind of um nice big thematic pillars or or um focusing on your architecture you're just sort of like trying to chase a, a, th a thread with your nose to the ground so i didn't really want to be constrained by um the kind of plot points of the first game and then sort of try to like extend them artificially it felt mm -hmm. it didn't feel like it was a good fit yeah i mean i definitely think like horror anthology is such a great series to follow because you can do whatever you want and i would say that darkest dungeon kind of follows this set where it's it's horror anthology and there are references and you know parallels to the last game, but it's still kind of set in its own story. Yeah, a lot. There's I little mean, nods and winks, but totally. a lot of it is still its own self. And, and there's no, I make no kind of like apologies about you know th this IP is heavily rooted in kind of Lovecraftian stuff, and that was something that he did. His stories ostensibly could are all compatible. There's cross pollination of ideas and even places uh, between them. Um, but they aren't like one single linear arc of like one person going through each of these adventures. They're all just sort of like a kind of, yeah, just a cross section of, of time and, and place. 
Yeah, I mean, like, Miskatonic University is exactly. referenced a couple times, but it doesn't mean that, like, oh, Reanimator happened, and then Dagoth, and then, you know, it's it's all kind of vague, and that's the point. Yeah, exactly. It's intentionally vague. Yeah. So, I, I did want to continue on one thing, too, which is, um, in Darkest Dungeon 1, the story was kind of not told to you directly. It was told, uh, I want to say, like, through notes but essentially like the ancestor would tell you this is what i did when i created the the swine or the flesh and that was after or right before the boss fight when you would fight them mm -hmm. this time we kind of have the academic telling us the story after we have defeated a confession boss and we're learning just more and more about a singular character and sort of his effect on the world yeah what was kind of the creative decision about that well, um, I wanted to embrace something a little bit more episodic. So, mm -hmm. um, and I felt like, you know, given that it's a, a run based game, I felt like you'd want to learn a little bit more each time you started a run or each time you kind of failed a run or succeeded. Like every time you kind of do the, the game loop, um, I felt like the best way to tell that story was to drip in story content as, as part of that kind of journey, um, as opposed to kind of. Uh, arresting you on a loading screen, giving you like a, a three-part lore dump on a specific boss. Um, and mm -hmm. I, we also like felt that the focus should be on the characters. So instead of kind of three-part horror stories for each boss, like in the first game, um, I did five-part horror stories for each character, uh, each um, protagonist uh, in, in Darkest Dungeon 2. And I felt like bringing the focus more on the characters um, was more authentic to what the academic's uh, perspective would be. I think he would know more about that stuff than would about like the various mutations and oddities that might have popped up in the landscape in the intervening however long since things kind of started to go crazy. Um, I don't think he would have a deep connection to these kind of mutant aberrations. He wouldn't be able to sort of, you know, um, right. Explain their he's, their background. He's, he's repulsed by them and like, holy cow, this is right. crazy too. Um, so it felt like more appropriate and more in line with kind of the tone of the game, which is about, look, you know, everybody's done things that they don't, that they aren't proud of. Everybody's made mistakes. Everybody's been kind of beat down. And at the end of the day, we're just a bunch of people who are beat down, but we only have each other to kind of get through stuff. So um, it felt like exploring how each of these characters was you know their origin story essentially i think of the heroes in darkest dungeon as like yeah. medieval x-men right so they've got their costumes and their powers and uh they have their origin stories so we felt like leaning in on that um made a lot of sense so i, I guess we can transition that into the the next segment that i want to ask you about which was the heroes the characters and the shrines because those are some fantastic like lore and story building and creative puzzles and gameplay all sort of integrated into these segments that give you more more abilities mm -hmm. and sort of develop the character story as well so I, I have to ask um in darkest dungeon one it was kind of the same deal like dismas for example would make an offhanded comment oh i was in prison or you know oh you're worse than the prison guards and now we see him escaping from prison in this game as part of his memory how far out did you plan some of these backstories with these characters? Uh, well, several years. Um, back before we even started Dark Dungeon 2, uh, we, you know, we released a bunch of one-page comics, essentially sort of giving, um, you know, like a very brief cross-section that would allude to kind of some of their backgrounds or origin stories. So the goal here was to sort of take that, which was really like an ancillary kind of just experiment outside of the game, and, and and bring it into or adapt that stuff to fit um, and become kind of the, the canonical origin of each of the heroes. So we had that stuff like mapped out um, quite a while ago, loosely. Um, there's a lot of work that had to go into structuring them in five parts, um, being economical with the words, but still describing a lot, and then figuring out um, how we were going to present, like which events would be tentpole enough to warrant a sort of a combat encounter, and then how would we build that puzzle? Um, so it was a, lo a lot of work went into that stuff. Um, I think it's a really cool part of the game. Um, 
And I think it's like a, a really neat way of kind of unlocking skills. Like the more they kind of process their their trauma and their grief, the more, um, you know, they unlock their potential. And I really like that kind of connection. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I think it's a nice breakup of the typical combat that you would normally see. And now it's like, oh, now we have a little puzzle with this character and we're kind of learning just a little bit more about them. And how did they get to this position that they find themselves in right now? Yeah. And some and of so, them you're, you're not meant to win. I mean, they're, yeah. you're there just to sort of create a little bit of an experience. You know, there's a man at arm, the first man at arms kind of encounter is he, he's a very proud, you know, but on inexperienced general and every command you give puts your troops in disarray and you watch them get massacred until finally he throws up his hands and gives up. Um, and I think it's just neat to kind of put players in the position uh, of the heroes for, for just a brief moment and uh, sort of helps ground, you know, the the verbiage around it. You know, you can kind of call back to some, some visuals as well. Um, so with that too, we, we have a lot of characters returning and some new ones as well. I will ask about the Antiquarian, which mm -hmm. was returning as an enemy, was a very unexpected um, yeah, that was choice. Fun. I I was not expecting it. Cool. I would have, and uh, you know, what kind of singled her out as like we want to make her a, a mini boss over, say, the Abomination sure. or whoever else. Um. Well, this is me personally. Okay, so I, I know that there's a lot of people who who really have attached themselves to the different heroes, and I and I love them all because. Uh, you know they're all kind of in they're you know they're, they're all your creation well they're, you know not yours, yeah. So, yeah and so i i uh, i have a soft spot for all of them but if i had to map them out morally i always felt that the leper was the best of them um and that the antiquarian was the worst of them i think that if her her focus you know in my mind was you know, not just wealth but power and finding you know occult relics and i think you have to be kind of merciless in that game i think a lot about like indiana jones villains how they're always like swooping yep. in at the last yep. minute screw them over take the relic um and so i thought okay but well, what if you know what if they were successful in that instead of you know coming up against an indiana jones they were coming up against like joe jones and uh he's just not as good <laughs> as his brother indiana so they always end up with the relics and they get more powerful and so her origin um comic uh, sort of featured her you know, playing second fiddle to what looks to be like an occultist or a warlock of some kind. And uh, he's about to do like a human sacrifice and she kills him before he can complete the ritual. And then we left it open-ended on purpose, but the implication is strongly that she completes the ritual to get the, yeah. the power. She's yeah. not going to set this the, the victim free. Um, and so I just felt like this was a really exciting way of... You know, if everything's falling apart and all the world's riches are kind of just laid bare as people are struggling to just survive and, you know, monsters are popping up everywhere, she'd be out looking out for herself. And so I, it felt like really natural and appropriate that she'd, you know, kind of collect a gang around her, um, loosely call back to the brigands from the first game. She'd kind of get her underworld thugs together and uh, she'd be just going out looking out for her for number one. Yeah, I mean, there is that quote that's tied to the game that is, uh, at the end, men will become monsters. And that's the case. Like, yeah, we have four heroes who want to, you know, fix this problem, but there are probably just as many people who want to profit from all this destruction in the world. Yeah, exactly. And if, if she is as greedy as we, we think she is, she would go for it. Yeah, I don't think there's any, there's any question. I don't think redemption is really a thing that she's looking for. Um, we suggested this too in her Crimson Court trinkets. Um, one of them is called Part, you know, Two of Three or something. Two of so, Three. Yeah. Yeah. So she's she's looking for something, and that's what she cares about. You know, um, it's yeah. not about like regret or anything. She's just single-minded in her pursuit. So, uh, you know, all of that uh, just makes me feel like she's a she's a great a great ambush villain. Um, I think the Abomination, for instance, you know, is bestial and ferocious, but I think he's kind of tragic. I mean, it's bruce banner and the hulk right so yep i just feel like if you were beating up on him in beast mode people who are familiar with the first game would be like i'm beating up on that skinny pasty guy like you know <laughs> inside that's who he is and that i don't really right. love that um so uh, it, it's a tragedy but sometimes that tragedy is a little too far yeah like, exactly yeah it, bring it back just and i don't bit. think he's necessarily a bad guy the same way i think that i think the antiquarian is maybe a little bit less uh, 
morally guided. Right. Well, m less morally guided does not mean pure evil. No, There's, I think it's just, you know. I, I can't remember all of the D&D &D things, but I just put her at kind of true neutral. Evil, maybe. Or, yeah. It's, or neutral, chaotic, neutral, maybe. Something I don't know. like that, yeah. Out for herself and herself alone is kind of yeah. the best way to describe it. Um, so I'll just ask this one, and we can be kind of vague. You know, if we don't see a hero like, say, the Crusader. Like, or hypothetically, the, right. Hypothetically, just yeah. some random guy, like a Crusader or something, or an Abomination, or even a Houndmaster, or maybe just like some random dog. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean that, you know, if we don't see them, they're dead? Or does that mean, you know, they're just not around right now? No, I don't think... We've never gone out and said so and so died, or they're never coming back. I, I think that's. I, I kind of laugh when I see those theories. Like I kind of chuckle right. to myself. People are so, they're very keen for certainty, and um, I think like the crossroads is almost like a metaphorical, or allegorical kind of uh, place. You know, people who want to find. Uh, themselves again end up drawn there you know kind of out of this like oblivion that the world is kind of falling into so just because they're not there doesn't mean they're gone um that's what i'll say about that okay um yeah pragmatically uh i you know i want to bring back um more of the dd1 cast but i'd also like to bring out some new heroes so um mm -hmm. you know we're we're going to be taking a look at that in the, in the future. Yeah, awesome. I'm I am for, you know, either characters returning or seeing what else because now the we saw it with the runaway and I like her. To see what else is. I think she turned coming. out great. I'm I'm really happy with the runaway. I feel like she belongs. I, I like that she's kind of unconventional and yeah, like just a homeless urchin kind of character. A homeless kind of. urchin who kind of found her own way and she's she's a survivor. She's kind of living in this world that's fallen into ruin yeah exactly so i think she was a great like you know kind of new addition to the cast for for the 1.0 um but yeah i mean if our our community support has been really strong and we're really really grateful for that and and so you know our our goal is to continue to, to build out and support this game uh you know over the next however long awesome yeah so i'm being business vague uh, i'm I, but i don't want to i don't want to make like promises yeah. or whatever but um completely we haven't said anybody's night. dead and we love the cast just as much as as, a, as other people so yep exactly um so i, I did want to ask this one too which is not related to the heroes but instead to like some of the npcs so like the hoarder uh, a couple of the innkeepers even like the triage nurse i think that uh, some of them are like a wink and a nod obviously back towards darkest dungeon one like hoarder definitely gives off caretaker vibes and yeah. i think like nomad wagon there's she makes a reappearance the tavern owner he makes a reappearance mm -hmm. um what kind of prompted their return was it just we think they're cool we want to bring them back in or is it something more going on there like now they are not in the estate anymore they're out, they're out here um, well, there's a there's a line about the hoarder in the game um, yeah. where it says he's kind of, you know, distracted uh, almost as if he's in two places at once. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, you know, some of it is just like playful kind of consistency. I just thought it'd be neat if, you know, you could encounter the tavern owner, you know, again with the kind of adjusted proportions, you know, he shows up again as a as an inn owner in the second game some of that is is really you know born of fun but i think the um you know the explanation for it uh i think can still track uh again i don't i mean talking about darkest dungeon one i don't know how spoilery i'm allowed to be uh darkest dungeon one you are free okay. to like, spoil well whatever. it's a time loop right so you know what the heir is always arriving and always warning himself not to arrive simultaneously. Like you're haunting right. yourself. You're trying to warn yourself, but you know it's futile. And the whole game's theme is, you know, nihility and futility. So you keep arriving, even though you keep telling yourself not to arrive. You're just stuck doing the same thing kind of forever. So I feel like that takes. Once that eddy develops, I feel like it. it 
is no longer part of the actual world, right? Like it's its own thing repeating again and again and again and again forever. Um, and so the, the, the people there, you know, life would move on in, the, in kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the temporal reality, I guess, um, while this like almost illusory loop continues to propagate itself. Um, so I guess, you know, in that sense, uh, I felt like it was okay. I think the caretaker could have kind of escaped the manor at some point, you know, while uh, a version of him was stuck in a loop somewhere in this um, kind of awful nightmare fantasy of the air. Um, so I think, you know, because it is kind of time and spacey, it's a bit of like a, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a little vague because it's supposed to be, and yeah. even that line is, I always take those with a little bit of, little bit of salt with them where, you know, He's in two places at once. Maybe he is. Like, yeah. maybe that is the guy who is simultaneously at the estate and also out here. He's he's just one of those. Maybe he has something more going on with him that he's able to do that, or maybe it's like you said, he escaped and now the the piece of him that's still trapped there is connected, or something. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, I think I think along those lines, and I'm really reticent to just like lay out like lay out exactly how I imagined the games being compatible because I feel like in the in the the empty space people can kind of like concoct their own theories I think that's a lot of fun and, and so I'm really reluctant to just be like okay look I'll share my timeline document with you and then we'll just map <laughs> it all out together and uh, there'll be no mystery um, so I think, you know, little... I think that was my job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, little touches like like some voice lines and like some recurring characters, I think really in the second game help remind us that like reality itself uh, is, is kind of buckling under the weight of this like cosmic kind of onslaught. So things don't necessarily make sense. For instance, uh, it's always the same academic study, um, you know, over and over yeah. and over again. There's a reason for that. I don't want to spoil the game, but... Uh, it, it it's justifiable and proper that it should be that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense if you've beaten the game. Exactly. Why it's that study over and over and over again. And so precisely, yeah. So there's stuff like that in the first game that I still am sitting on, and I see. I love going to like Reddit or seeing people get into big arguments and stuff in our Discord. I like it's such a treat that people are so interested and they want to like discuss and connect over it. So I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to overstep, you know? Right, you, you, you leave out the crumbs and you let people kind of connect them from there. Yeah. Continuing on to the next piece, that, or next segment that I wanted to talk to you about, which was these new areas. So in the last game we had, um, I think it was the four starter areas, mm -hmm. plus uh, Courtyard, Color of Madness, and then obviously the Darkest Dungeon itself. This time we have uh, the valley, the sprawl, the tangle, the feeder, uh, the shroud, the sluice, and the mountain. And so each area, I think, is definitely like unique in its in its presentation. Like, and uh, I guess if we want to start with like the valley, it seems very old road, like very fall. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the fall, like the leaves are falling. You know, it's a little dark. It, it looks like a dark fantasy village that you would just travel through. Places are boarded up, but it seems relatively okay. Mm -hmm. um, moving forward, is there any any plans to like add more to that area? The valley specifically? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, actually, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. I, I like the valley because it's meant to be just the last little bit of idyllic kind of space left. Um, and even mm -hmm. that, you know, monsters are starting to kind of show up. So I think it does its job, which is kind of a bummer because I think it's one of the best looking levels. Like, I wouldn't mind yeah. blowing that out into a full region at some point. But um, we haven't, we haven't like planned for it. I think um, it it's doing its job really well because we want more of it. And sometimes if we get more of it, it won't feel as desirable if that makes sense right um, yeah I, i'm not thinking more like oh i want a whole region of the valley no more like in that in that stretch that you're going to the first in is there going to be more like pieces added along the way yeah potentially like I mean, you cross I the old bridge yeah and then i wouldn't rule it out um it's not something that we're like 
you know, we don't have it served up on, on our task tracker ready to go. Um, but we're always, you know, we've, I think our early access on Darkest Dungeon 2 really proved that, you know, collectively as a team, you know, we're not, um, we're not scared of really taking a hard look at the game and, and ripping out stuff that doesn't work and trying to rebuild it into something better. Um, we did that, you know, with three huge areas uh, of the game over the past uh, year and a bit. So um, if we had a cool idea that would involve valley surgery, hell yeah, we would do it. Um, <laughs> I think like we're very um, like creativity first or creatively motivated as a studio. So if the idea is solid and, and worth doing, then then we'll get there. Um, final boss mechanics, you know, that was a huge push for the team to do, but we all really believed that it was the best way to pay off, you know, the, the whole game that you'd just been playing. Um, uh, and I think that just, that carries all the way down through, um, even the, the Vestal changing up how her, uh, she's a more complex character now with uh, with the consecrations mm -hmm. mechanically that she puts on the ground. You know, that was just a really cool idea. So we wanted to, to lean in on it. So, I mean, I guess it's a little bit long-winded, but if if we stumble on a really great idea that involves the valley, then we'll uh, we'll attack it with uh, with zeal. All right, I would say yeah, I love the consecrations. That is, I, at first I was a little hesitant, but man, once I started using them, like I, I can't imagine not using them anymore. Yeah, I think what was cool about that is that um, you know our design team took kind of a bread and butter character from the first game. And, and made her actually like mechanically nuanced, which um, was a was a real was a real win, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, so continuing on, I think uh, my favorite area. I'm sure you probably have one, and I'll ask you in a moment. But the sprawl is definitely like when I think Darkest Dungeon Two, I think the sprawl that really? city okay. on cool. fire. Yeah, that just just fire for miles and the great city. It's even that quote, the great city of man brought to ruin. And so what kind of like for each area, if you want, or we can just go through them each one, but what was kind of the design inspiration for each area? Um, well, each or creative inspiration, yeah, each kind of area and their fa their associated faction was kind of meant to mirror um, or, or sort of suggest a response to the end of the world. So the sprawl, the the burning city, the guys who've like, you know, mutilated themselves and they're melting away, is all meant to be sort of, um, you know, anarchy. Um, the anarchy nihilist. nihilist it's, it's all burn it all ruined. down. It's, it's gonna fall apart. Down. Let's let's try to have some semblance of control by accelerating the destruction and just reveling in it and and losing our minds. Um, yeah, that that's kind of that region's thing. So really, cut off your nose to spite your face. Bunch of people hanging out mm -hmm. in the burning cities, um, and and you know to to really reinforce that, you know, it's books everywhere. The boss is the librarian because I sort of not grabbed onto this idea that um, I, I hate when people when books get banned. Uh, I, I was appalled reading like Fahrenheit four fifty one by Ray Bradbury back in the day, where the fireman's job mm -hmm. is to just like torch illegal books. Um, and so I feel like they're a great symbol of, you know, obviously knowledge and and the preservation of knowledge uh, for future generations. So the idea that there's stacks of burning books everywhere and yes, the buildings are falling into rubble, but and there's people strung up. But the real horror is they're like they're look they're looking for um, our great their achievements and, and deliberately trying to destroy them. Um, so, yeah, that's that's why the boss is the librarian. Cause I, I thought okay. it'd be cool if he gotcha. kind of went mad and was like, all oh, this has got to go. <laughs> it's it, We just got to burn it all. We got to burn it. And yeah, I mean, when if when you really think about it, when the world kind of ends, whatever is left over from the previous world, if we had books, if we had written something written that we could carry with us, like that would be immensely useful. Yeah, but but this kind of so much completes the, the destruction of... Of humanity in a way so uh that right. they're meant to just be like yeah the accelerant really and so uh with the tangle the lost battalion which i think a lot of people really did love at least from what i've been seeing like people love the tangle cool uh, so the the lost battalion they kind of just they they gave up and they just yeah. let the vines overgrow them it's like resignation so you know i can't do anything about it uh i'm I'm small and tiny, nothing matters, I don't matter, I don't care, I give up. Um, so, you know, we allude to it in the, in the game where, you know, they might have marshaled a big army to sort of stop the 
advance of uh, you know these kind of cultists. And uh, when they saw what the cultists were and what they looked like, they just they didn't even fight. They just gave up and started wandering around. Like all their minds were kind of broken. And so you can see none of them have any shoes. <laughs> Uh, Because they, like, worn them out from just wandering around in the woods. Um, And, uh, yeah, the boss there is the Dreaming General. I thought it would be a really cool idea that, you know, he's this huge, powerful-looking warrior, but he's just completely retreated into his own mind. And you don't even really fight him. You fight... He's having a nightmare, and you're fighting the kind of, like, plant growth around him. Um, And and that kind of completes the idea that it's just, like, they've just kind of gone catatonic. Um, Not dead, but just you know kind of shuffling just kind of give it up yeah exactly like, like you said and then um it's weird that you said that because i always wondered like when i'm when i'm fighting the general i'm wondering like oh is it am i really fighting the general or am i fighting this tree like yeah which one is really in control here yeah yeah exactly and i just thought it was cool you know they they've been wandering around for so long yeah they're getting plants and stuff growing on them through them in them and obviously nature's all screwed up so it felt like it fit yeah and uh the feeder and i personally like the feeder is a really cool area but i i never go to it late game just because of all the disease and everything in there and yeah but it is a the plague eaters all those teeth man that is just a oh or uh, uh kevin is there a name for like a fear of teeth i don't, don't know but i don't know but i was trying to lean in on it um <laughs> our our lead modeler always gives me a hard time because every time we start a new faction he's like what is going to be the thing right because it's like so many flesh drips in the sprawl so many leaves in the tangle so many teeth in the fetter uh <laughs> like he's just uh, feeder feeder yeah, yeah it's fetid right fetid? i don't know anyway um yeah, so the idea there was uh, the kind of a smoke them if you've got them. So it, again, what's the response to the end of the world here? It's like, let's empty the larder, have a big feast, eat and eat and gorge ourselves and do all the drugs and, uh, you know, kind of hedonism writ large. And um, yep. I felt like if your desire to eat and consume was augmented to a supernatural level, yeah, you'd grow extra mouths to taste things differently. And um, so that whole area is just built on... Uh, consumption and kind of yeah self-indulgence Just because you feel like yeah you yeah. feel like it's all over anyway so i might as well um i might as well have a second Just slice of cake up. yeah yeah I, we're not gonna see tomorrow and i might as well enjoy this uh velvet red velvet cake exactly and i and i really or love the, uh, the meat stalks that uh pushed through the ground or whatever it was yeah and i and i love that um <laughs> you know they, they eat corpses uh, you know, and, yep. and get healed and buffed from it. So it was a really nice, like, mechanical nod to the to the theme there. Um, you know, same same way. I actually in the in the tangle that there's a lot more like block in play because they're just they're just tough and they were an army. They were designed to kind of prevent the cult from yeah. reaching and they're the mountain, kind of like you un- said. So they're, they're ready too. to fight. Yeah, but and then in the ready in the, to fight, but they just never did. Yep. Yeah. And then the final region, um, the the shroud, which we added in early access. Um, which I think looks really good. Um, it's it's like mm-hmm. adaptation and supplication. So they find a new they find a, they pray to a new god to try to save them, you know, and and in doing so, compromise their kind of humanity. So uh, also straight up, it, it gotta have fish people in the oh, game. Yeah. Gotta That's have a- them. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I really love this idea of you know like a like a coastal kind of fishing area that that gets kind of overrun and um you know you can see the sailors and fishermen and everything and and that's why there's so much like incubation and mutation in that zone is kind of like the the willful allowance of like change and adaptation to somehow sort of survive whatever um armageddon is going on yeah it's that it's the desperate need to survive at the end like i will do whatever it takes just to see tomorrow yeah even if it means like i will change my whole body into a fish person i will just have a fish I, baby I, I survive to survive yeah i will become a, a fish baby to survive there you go yeah um so yeah that's that's kind of the the idea was that we would reflect um a response to the end in in each region and with each faction um and then there is the sluice which is another very nice nod to yeah. the the warrens i I really did like that of all the areas that returned, the Warrens in particular were the one. 
and Wilbur. Yeah. So what, I, what kind of drove that choice? Uh, I thought, just thought it would, I mean, that one was just kind of for fun. Like, I felt like it was plausible if they live in these massive underground connected tunnels. You know, who's to say they wouldn't dig their way, you know, out somewhere, you know, connect to another network somehow. And, and they're kind of like uh, vermin, right? In the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you, there's a lot of lines in the first games, you know, they breed quickly and uh, all the rest of this stuff. So I, I consider them like I know they're pigs and they're sort of like Darkest Dungeons orcs a little bit. Um, but they're a little like like radish too, you know, they scrabble around down yeah. in the dark. They're feeding on whatever they can. And, and multiplying and spreading so it felt like a natural kind of fit and um and i thought you know the having a bonus kind of area that's like higher difficulty higher reward um you know made up made a lot of sense to to bring back our our favorite piggies and and our least favorite piggy wilbur yeah and he's uh he's all grown <laughs> up now <laughs> he's all grown up now and so i and this is one that really kind of like boggles my mind and I don't mean to blindside you with this but I have to bring it up there are two different versions of that line where they reference the hamlet they say oh it was in a hamlet far to the west and then I just recently heard the one that says oh it's far to the east yeah uh, I, it, it, was that just intentional just to throw people off no no I made a mistake I had to get the line oh. re-recorded. It's not this amazing revelation. It's just, I am a human being, and I wrote West when I should have wrote, written East. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it was my mistake. Well, now my map is ruined. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, um, it makes way more sense to see it on the East Coast. Plus, it's like it feels like an Atlantic Ocean that you're kind of the, the cove from the first game. Um, but I think I had written it and sent it off to uh, to Wayne to record. And then when I heard it in the game partway through early access, I'm like, oh God, no, we can't do that. So I had to bounce it back. Um, so gotcha. just just okay, human yeah. error there. Sorry. <laughs> you know you know what? It, the game is, it, hey, mistakes happen. It, it is what it is. Yeah. You learn. I think there's a case. I could I could have lied. Actually, I should I should have lied now that I think about it. It's like, well, who knows what direction it is? It's more mystery. <laughs> um, but no, I just, um, I had to make a correction. Okay. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> um, last little bit is the mountain, which, I mean, Sprawl might be my favorite, like, area to explore, but the mountain is like, wow, that is an impressive display. And with the cult especially, what was kind of the design choice from the cult that we see in Darkest Dungeon 1 to what we see in Darkest Dungeon 2? Like, they're definitely much more flesh and almost black ink i want to say yeah so like what was the creative directive with that i think in darkest dungeon one you're dealing with like people or things that used to be people that and again the whole theme is kind of body horror in that game where you know the earth is like an, essentially an egg for this like sleeping monster and humanity is just kind of mucus that's oh, weeped, uh, weeped out yeah. onto the top of the egg kind of thing um and so there's a lot of this like kind of uh mutation change stuff that, that we did with those cultists um in darkest dungeon 2 it's more like um this is just stuff from nowhere um and the scariest thing in the world is absolute nothingness so out, nothingness. out in this vast sea of nothingness um you know that that's been called into like the the reality of darkest dungeon 2 um th there's almost this like ecclesiastical kind of uh alt force but they're like single-minded and all in service of a a single kind of entity um which i don't you know mm -hmm. i don't want to spoil anymore which we will get to in a moment sure we're, we're almost to the spoilers <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah the the idea was to sort of you know they're gross and they have tentacles but they're not like it's not really leaning in on the body horror i liked the contrast of the opulent kind of silver and and like satiny kind of clothing um and and sort of the the religious kind of framework um because i felt like it it really clashed with the idea of like what's under that robe that's horrible and it, and it wouldn't be human you know at, at all or ever have been um and all their masks are upside down skulls. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is kind some of some of like, the masks are upside down. Some of them. Yeah. They, they all have the iron crown, which I'll ask about in a moment, like imprinted yeah. on their body. And yeah, it, it seems like if they 
this cult seems like they came from the stars almost. Yeah. Like they descended from the pitch black of space. Yeah, I mean, or or just from whatever parallel emptiness or you're driving whatever. the cart through, you know, they, they kind of yeah. are, are of that. I guess now I will give the spoiler warning. We are officially in huge spoiler territory for Darkest Dungeon 2. If you don't want to get spoiled, get out now. Evacuate. Um, play the game, definitely. Play the final boss. It is an experience. Play the final boss, beat the final boss, and just take a step away and sort of analyze what you see. And so I will begin talking about the mountain and the confession bosses. Oh boy, um, I don't even know where to start. I guess um, the choice of five acts being five sins or five confessions, I would have bet hard money that it was following the five stages of grief. Yeah, you. That's not lost. so much the case anymore. You would. Yeah, I would have. You lost. would not have that money anymore. I would. I would um, lose that money. <laughs> you know, it's five because there's five points on the on the Iron Crown. Iron Crown. Um, yep. And uh, I know the denial is the first stage, but it's the first stage of anything bad is pretending it didn't happen. So um, right. I saw these theories during early access that you know they're following the five stages of grief, and to me it's like you know I, I'm sure you could make an interesting story around that, but it's a little bit like the seven deadly sins where I'm like it's kind of been been done so that was never my intention to to follow that this was really just about like you did five things wrong um and how fitting because this thing that you end up worshiping has five points and the characters all have a five part backstory and everything's kind of like yep. linked back to that so I, i'm gonna ask this one which is you know the iron crown we kind of learn a bit more about that and it's a symbol that we saw through all of darkest dungeon one like People didn't even realize it in some cases until someone pointed it out, pointed it out to them that, you know, five, five slashes through a half circle. How far along or how far back did you guys kind of come up with this idea of the Iron Crown? Um, way, way far back. I mean, it was just a name we gave to what was the stress symbol. And, you know, really, mm. it was just meant to be like kind of spider sense, you know, like early, early days. Like, oh, we just need like an effect to show stress kind of punching into the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why the religious symbol in the game is like a circle with like the bars on the outside to like prevent the stress from getting in. Um, yep, that's where yep. that like iconography kind of came from. Um, you know, and then I think we started calling it the Iron Crown partway through Darkest Dungeon 1's uh, development just informally. Um, also called it the stress symbol for quite a while. So yeah, the stress <laughs> symbol. Um, but in terms of like, yes, it's everywhere in in Darkest Dungeon One, and and I allude to it in the end of the game uh, where the Earth explodes, and and you can see there's still like five points because um, it's meant to be this like deep seated terror or the knowledge that um, the latent knowledge that everybody has that they're really meaningless in the grand cosmos. And so whenever you get stressed, it kind of taps into that. So by the end of the first game, that's kind of what it became. Um, and I just thought it was like, it would be a neat exercise to see if um, we could take that and further add to its mythology and sort of try to up the stakes a little bit. So if you beat Darkest Dungeon 2, you can look back at DD1 and go, well, the ancestor didn't even really understand this thing. Um, which I think is kind of yeah. cool. Um, so the, the protagonist of, of the second game actually achieves a greater level of kind of cosmic knowledge than than the um, than the ancestor himself, um, who was unable to kind of like invoke it properly, but still knew that it was like a symbol of power. This is one question that I really wanted to ask, which is, you know, subverting expectations. And this kind of ties back into what you just spoke about with the, um, you know, it's five stages of grief, seven deadly sins. You know, subverting expectations in storytelling is a very difficult thing. And so how do you kind of balance the unexpected versus the deserved? Because if something is too unexpected, it doesn't make sense. If it's not deserved, then, or if it's too deserved, we see it coming from miles away. So, like, how do you kind of balance that when you're telling the story? Jeez, I don't know. That's tough. Um, I guess... 
I, I like I really like slow burn kind of horror that then has like a really dramatic uptick and it, and yeah you're right if if you telegraph it too soon uh, it's not surprising um, but I love when things kind of wrap back around so um, since we're in the spoiler country you know I was quite proud that the first time you meet the academic he pulls like hope out of his hole in his chest and you don't really think about mm -hmm. it until you know much later in the game you learn that's the wound where you actually you the player stabbed him so you stabbed him in. and I think yeah. it makes that moment more powerful because you're like oh he's getting hope out of the you know the the place of greatest pain right like the place mm -hmm. the sort of personification or the 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 like manifestation of of betrayal is where he's pulling hope for the future out of um so i i like that like callback where you look back on something and you have new information and you're like oh that means something a little bit different to me now um so i think like in terms of a of a workflow i mean i i don't know i you can't have too many gotchas, but you have to have the ones that that really land. Um, I guess I'm being kind of evasive. I don't I don't actually know how to answer this. That's um, that's a tough question. Part of it is intuitive, though. Like, um, I know that I, like I, I don't think a story is worth telling unless there is some level of expectation subversion. If you can't take people for a bit of a ride, then what, why are you telling the story? So. Mm -hmm. I'm consciously trying to think of doing things in in slightly unexpected ways. Bringing bringing back the antiquarian, for example, like we really like relish those kind of moments. So I approach building the the Darkest Dungeon two story with the same desire, where I, I want to have some surprises or I want to I want to earn the payoff. Um, but then the format kind of helps you. Like I know that I only can tell the story. Uh, when the first time you start a boss uh, and then when you beat that boss you get kind of the wrap up so really every chapter is just a two part chapter and then there's filler lines that run in between that reinforce what's happening in that chapter but they aren't essential because I need to build the story in a way that if you never lose you still understand the whole story so right. the most important bits are the first time you attempt a boss and then beating that boss. So if all you do is attempt and win five times in a row, you will understand the story. If you fail a bunch, you get extra kind of um, content that fleshes out kind of what was happening in those moments. But I couldn't rely on those bits to advance the plot in a meaningful way because I have to assume that a very good player will miss them. Um, so mm. that that was that was a big challenge, you know. Um, basically all i have is a is an intro and an outro for every boss and so i had to make those nice and punchy but if you graph it out the punchiness of them goes up over time so um the first reveal is you know we we found the symbol that was everywhere isn't that weird um you know the the next one is okay well it finishes with the there's a fire in the library and you were mad because you wanted to come forward with your research um so the stakes kind of move up a little bit so i tried to like beat it out in terms of intensity so that by the time you hit mm -hmm. the fourth boss uh, of ambition the stakes are really high and the action is way more dramatic and then that just really sets the stage for for the final boss fight which I've, yeah the introduction to that boss fight is the most like dramatic reveal of what the iron crown actually is and what it means to like invoke it and so um i was trying to just escalate each step yeah i it was the first time when you when you get to that final boss and you see the cinematic that plays it is shocking the the level of like oh my god this is what this is what the iron crown is about this is what we did yeah, it's and like so, you've got to face I, the worst parts of yourself all mashed together and kind of yep. kill it in order to actually have any kind of peace. And I I mean, that that intro, boss intro, really lands, and, and that's a credit to to our whole team. Like, I, you know, I have a role in that, but, I mean, the the presentation, the camera moves, the, the animation, the visual effects, like, um, all of that stuff that creates such a powerful moment. Um, I just want to make sure that the team gets... Uh, it's properly shouted out for that absolutely it's it's not a one-man operation it's a team yes yeah. and everyone has a role to play and it's when people start to work together like that that's that's when you start really getting that hope and i think that's kind of the whole point of darkest dungeon 2 is yeah things are bad but we can still pull together and we can still make it work and so uh just wanted to rapid fire just 
quick two questions, I guess, because um, kind of answered a few of them, but in chapter three, so speaking of raising the stakes, end of chapter two, we see the letter that gets sent to our protege. And in chapter three, we see the ancestor himself yeah. as like a, as a reference as, you know, he invited us to the estate. That mean, does this imply that, uh, you know, everything that's happening at darkest in darkest dungeon one did occur in some form maybe at some point it got stuck in its own time loop but yeah the hamlet exists the ancestor exists yeah i think so um okay i think uh you know he invites you out to this to the farmhouse um which is not you mm -hmm. know the actual estate from the first game um and he's trying to figure things out i consider it to be like early days ancestor um still kind of splashing around trying to like get his head around things um mm -hmm. but uh yeah i think i think it's compatible that he's been out in the world and then heads back to the manor and continues doing what he does there yeah it's um, it's just a little thing you know he he got into all manner of trouble even after we've kind of charted out everything that he did yeah there's still gaps in there that's obviously he could have done some more and, and i love the ancestor and so i like the idea that he gives the 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 protege in the second game just a little a little shitty nudge in the wrong direction mm -hmm. um because he's kind of responsible for so much awful stuff i i just felt like it was appropriate that you know if it's gonna go real bad, you know he's around somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, so he doesn't do anything uh... directly, but I think that, like, just by virtue of, of inviting and kind of, like, facilitating your kind of obsession with with this thing, um, was was just enough to kind of, like, he, he's a bit of the inception uh, of the of the obsession kind of phase of the story. And that's where it all kind of started, was that, I think that's when the game really kind of turns turns it up yeah exactly you see that still he, in obsession people are still struggling with that boss and that's yeah it's a whole other that's thing that's just the case i mean that whole chapter is meant to be the turning point i would say chapter three yeah we want to accelerate the the kind of like the ramp um following chapter mm -hmm. three um narratively and, and, every, and everything else um I guess just one more question before we kind of get into the the body horror of all the bosses because that's something that I really want to ask about. I know we're kind of stretched on time, but um, facing failure is a very like overarching theme of the game now, and that's kind of the whole point: face your failure. And I think that there's a more significantly hopeful message this time around. Is that something to kind of balance out the last game's like very nihilistic tone? Like, the last game had the line of victory, a hollow and foolish notion. This time, it seems like, no, 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 it's, it's bad, but you can get through it. Yeah, I mean, it's meant to kind of be the other side of the coin. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, you can look at things and think, well, it's kind of hopeless, and the more, the more I do, the worse it gets. Or you can look at things like, well, every time I get knocked down, I get back up again, and it just takes one of those those times to, to click, and, and you know, we can kind of push through whatever's going on. So, um, like I said, you know, kind of at the outset of our conversation, I I feel like we'd really explored nihility uh, and and kind of this onion skinning of, of awfulness right down to a rotten core, and um, it just didn't feel appropriate to try to do the exact same thing again only this time the boss is a different monster or um i just don't think it would have had the same kind of emotional heart um that, that the first game had if we were just trying to kind of echo what, what we'd done um so yeah it was definitely deliberate and and reinforced and kind of really structured this game uh, dark dungeon 2 around the idea that uh, perseverance and determination in, in the face of your own shortcomings and your own um, misdeeds, uh, you know, you, you can work through stuff, really. I mean, the whole game is really therapy. <laughs> you can, you can work therapy. through your baggage, you know, you, you can do it. it. It's not easy and it sucks and there's setbacks, um, but I think that marries perfectly with the run-like structure of the game. Sometimes you set out with good intentions and things fall apart, but you got to keep picking yourself back up and, and, and going back out there and, and eventually you'll get strong enough that uh, you can move past whatever it is you has been done to you or you might have done, you know? That's kind of the message. Of the yep. Game. Definitely. 
Um, so quickly, we'll just kind of talk about the each boss at the the confession bosses, and you know the shackles of denial, the seething sigh. Uh, what was the I or focus fault? Shoot him to focus fault. There it is. Um, the other one was uh, the rigorous reach, I believe, or ravenous, ravenous reach. Yeah. My bad. And um, your body of work. In terms of body horror, you guys definitely cranked it up a notch after Act 1 is a little, you know, okay, yeah, these these padlocks and this brain. Act 2, oh boy, that is a that is a creature. It was it was tough though, man, because you know when we launched early access, we only had one boss in, and so people would beat the the shackle boss and be kind of like, "Oh, like that's it? That wasn't that crazy." And I, you know, it was kind of stressful because I'm like, well, it's not all we're going to do. You know, internally, we're, we're sort of saying, like, we have to leave room to... This is the first boss, you know? Yeah. Um, so I remember reading a lot of, like, kind of people being let down that it wasn't something crazy like the Heart of Darkness in the first game. And I'm like, it can't be. Like, we can't open with that, but we'll get there. And I feel like we did in the end, um, for sure. Uh, and, yeah, the the seating side is... You know, we I wanted a dragon, Um in the game so it's a dragon <laughs> yeah um and i like the idea that you're sort of you're attacking or you're you're battling these kind of um these organs which symbolize the type of failure uh that you're trying to reconcile so you know when you're resentful it's a lot of muttering and exhaling and puffing and puffing and so it felt cool that like you know in in your in your mind you can kind of construct this like horrible lung dragon um same thing with the eyes, yeah. uh, you know, same thing with the arms. So it's like, I, and I like bringing it all together uh, at the end where it's like, no, this is what you made. Like ruminating on your on your screw ups will create a, a monster, you know, like a, and it'll feel impossible to defeat. And yeah, that's, that's my, that's the line from the ending that I love, which is, you know, we make mountains of our mistakes and monsters of our misdeeds. And that's what we see, like, he buried the protege buries these these mistakes and these feelings and eventually they come to roost in forms of these monsters yeah because um yeah successfully uh, yeah completing that that ritual or whatever allows him to project his mind or his consciousness out onto reality so it becomes a, yep. an image of that and if you're if you're kind of a compromised person and you're given absolute power, you will be corrupted absolutely. So it's uh, it's kind of a testament to that idea. All right. And so uh, I will ask this too. If, if the areas are a reflection of his own perception of them, if that makes sense. So for example, in the sprawl, the library is burning. In act two, we learned that there was a fire in the library. Is he kind of projecting his own like yeah. memory of the event? Okay, yeah. um, you can see uh, Act Act Two is is tied to the city and the library. Um, act uh, Act Three, or, sorry, Act the the Tangle is where the the original um, the original academic study was in the fourth one. Um, so I tried to tie in the farmhouse is Act Three uh, obsession. So. Um, I tried to tie these like key locations, uh, the, the sort of boss habitat almost, um, you know, he would fix, the protege would fixate on these things and, and to call back to what we were saying earlier, that's why it's the same academic study everywhere because he's like, you know, his, his mind is stuck on what was going on there and so he manifests it all over the place um, because he's got this kind of like god power gone mad right right and uh those were real places like i i imagine those were real places in the kingdom and if you actually like um when, as you unlock things in the altar of hope we have like um lore narration there too where yep the academic oh, oh, yeah. talks to you as if you guys kind of went on a bit of a country trip together in simpler times and we're sort of he's like reflecting on kind of the 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 beauty of some of these places uh before everything kind of fell asunder and um, I, th I thought that was a really nice, like, uh, contrast to, like, the sort of uh, morbidity that w exists everywhere else in the game. Yeah, so, I mean, like, just like you said, he reflects on that personally. So, like, uh, in the Shroud, he mentions, you know, the sea boundless and full of possibilities. 
I kind of wonder if that was supposed to be like Act 4 was ambition. Because the the ravenous reach, and then you have the Leviathan's hand, and then you have just this whole idea of extending beyond and changing and this ambition to become something more. That could track. That could track? Okay. <laughs> well, I guess I'm on the right path. <laughs> I'm sure I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll workshop it. See if it see if it tracks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I I um, I put the the academic study that's in the story there in in the forest for for Act Four. Um, but uh, all of the themes are are sound, and and I think uh, it all sort of echoes back in and around on itself uh, on purpose because you're meant to sort of be living halfway in someone's in someone's mind um, but i didn't want right. to make it all a dream because that's like such a cop-out so i yeah i wanted to make sure that it was like no these are real places with real people that are getting all screwed up because nothing makes any sense anymore uh and and, and you did it you're responsible for it so you got to confess to it if you're going to try to stop it uh, as opposed to like well it's all one allegory for everything inside one person's brain I didn't I didn't want to go that far with it I think it's important that it's a real place and it has real consequences um, and it's not a fully imagined space uh, although the protege's imagination is ruining the real space right it's it's the effects of the mind on the world yeah. itself instead of sort of the world on the mind yeah and if you uh, max out the the hero tracks uh, at the Altar of Hope, then the academic kind of implies what that character will do when the game is done. Uh, yep. Which I yep. thought was like... You will a, guard these old roads. Yeah, I thought it was a nice kind of way of wrapping it up. And I guess definitely speaks to the sort of superhero conception of, of, these, uh, of these heroes, um, where they kind of finally become the hero we, we deserve. The hero we we deserve in these trying times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, uh, just as a as a final question, I guess to tie back in, you know, where do we kind of go forward from here? Not just in terms of next game. Let's not even let's not even address that. Like, Please, just let's in not address that. This, yeah, I'm let's so not tired. address that. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just in this, uh, just in Darkest Dungeon Two, kind of what do we see going forward? Because uh, Crimson Court kind of told the story of the ancestors' origins, and I'm as far as like new areas, new heroes, new new monsters, new academic quotes? Question mark? Because I yeah. might need some of those in the future. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> without like, like the the, t the absolute truth is, you know, we've sketched in some plans. Um, but it was a big push to get the game across the finish line. And as I said, the team's kind of resting right now. So we're not like, um, you know, we're going to hit the ground uh, uh, on Monday, I guess, and, and get back to it. Um, so we're building towards some stuff uh, that I obviously got to keep a little close to the chest. But there's no shortage of appetite for us to continue to like grow and, and add to this game. Um, we're very fortunate that it found an audience and, and we, we really love the IP. We wouldn't have gone for a second game in the same IP if we didn't feel like there was so much more to kind of explore and and build and, and share with people. So um, we want new heroes. We want new regions. We want new enemies. We want more Wayne June in the game. We want more Stuart Chatwood in the game. Um, yes, so, absolutely. Uh, it would be a, a, a real blessing to uh, have this game find the same support uh, that the first one did and allow us to continue to grow and expand it over the coming years. That's certainly what we want to do. We're, we're motivated creatively to, to really provide that. So, you know, it's a, it's a business um, at the end of the day, you know, fortunately, although I'm very proud of this creative work, um, but uh, so long as we feel like there's, there's a, there's an audience, you know, the, the team at Red Hook wants to keep uh, growing this thing. So, this is the smallest right. darkest dungeon will ever be right now today there you go it, sh it should only grow and tomorrow here. is a new day <laughs> yeah that's right um so yeah we've got some some loose plans sketched in and, and we're starting to move towards them but um nothing you know firm enough that i can really talk about it's that whole thing right like you want a little bit of surprise and we want to be ready to deliver on our promises so as opposed to calling the shot you know 
six, eight months in advance, um, it's, it's better to make sure that all of our ducks are in a row and we're feeling really good and confident about the material before we start talking about it. Absolutely. You know, you got to, you have to make sure that you have everything in place and set up. And then when you release, you're golden and everyone can just see like, oh my God, I can't believe that this is what they've been working on this whole time. And I think that's how a lot of people felt when Act 4 and Act 5 released. It was like, holy crap, this is... And I think the devs, Red Hook specifically, you guys always said, we're, we're much further along than people realize. And boy, howdy, were you. I was... Yeah, it's a tricky struggling thing. Struggling to catch up on some of this. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's tough because you know, we, we have to be ahead of our release schedule, obviously, that goes without saying. But, um, you know, we're, we're always working you know the staff doesn't all work on the same thing all at the same time so different parts of the game are advancing at different speeds depending on where we find ourselves in the schedule um and i and i know that for end users who aren't familiar with how game development works um that can be sometimes kind of confusing or, or frustrating because they think well why don't you just put more people on task x and sometimes um there's actually no return on investment for putting more people on a single task and you know why so it's it's a it's a non-linear kind of process um but we're always uh you know working out ahead of of our next drop so you know we're we're in progress with with some of the new stuff um but we definitely had to to rest everybody up because it was a real concerted effort to get across the finish line so all right thank you again chris and thank you to everyone on red hooks team this has been an amazing game an amazing experience thank you so much for the interview any final words that you would like to uh, impart on the people? Oh, I just want to say thanks to anybody who's watching this or who's played the game or, or sketched or gotten a tattoo or dressed up in a costume or any kind of uh, involvement with uh, with our IP is uh, is a really special thing and, and we're very grateful for it. So we're we're keen to continue to to do our thing and, and work to support uh, you guys and, and we're really appreciative of of all of the the love that we see. So thank you. All right. Thank you again. We will end the interview right here.